الله أما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع الذين من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم ترى كيف فعل ربك بعاد برمضات العماد التي لم يقلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذي وثمود الذي جاب الصخرة بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوطاد I recited these verses from the Quran to remind you about the importance of history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses history as a very powerful argument to remind you about the purpose of your lives. The purpose of life is to worship your Creator. Because He's so powerful, He's so wise, you submit to Him. You submit to His power and you submit to His wisdom. We are not more powerful, powerful than our Creator. We are not more wise than Him. Therefore, we submit to Him. So Allah, to make that very point, gives us examples of those who came before, before us. Those who lived and died before us. Allah talks about their achievements, their monuments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how they used to carve mountains, how strong they were physically, how sophisticated they were. And despite all that, they are gone. What they took with them is what they did when they were alive. And if people did good, the reward was and will be good. If they did bad, the reward will be bad. For that very purpose today we talk about the Mongol invasions. We learn from our history. History can never be ignored. Nations, people, communities, societies that forget their histories are also forgotten. I request that you turn your phones off, especially those kind of ringtones. <laughs> Sorry? A connection problem? Okay then, we leave it. Thank you for burning. You know, you guys need to fix your aerials. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is, instead, we're going to use your footage later on, inshallah. So, people who forget their history are forgotten by history. Those who forget the history are condemned to relive it. Why? Because you don't learn anything, any lessons from your history. History teaches you what was done right. And if it was done right, it needs to be repeated. It needs to be upheld. It needs to be kept alive. And if something was done wrong, then we don't repeat it. Because as Einstein said, anyone who continues to do the same thing to get different results is a fool. That's why we learn from our experience. That's why Allah talks about history so much in the Quran. Allah talks about Banu Israel, Allah talks about Farahina, Allah talks about the people of Ad and Thamud and other nations. For this very purpose, to learn from their mistakes, be wise. For that purpose, the Muslims more so today need to learn from the history. And we are a people, unfortunately, who have completely forgotten our history. Generally speaking, when we speak to Muslim masses, Muslim youngsters, Muslim elders, you go to a mosque, you speak to any standard Muslim and ask them about the history, they will have no idea. And I'm not exaggerating. I can demonstrate that to you. Right now in this very hall, if I ask you basic questions about your history, you will not have the answers. This is the catastrophe we are facing. Forget about all the other catastrophes we're facing, Islamophobia, xenophobia, hate against Muslims, disasters, catastrophes, okay, killings of Muslims around the world, whether it's uh, African, Central African Republic, or whether it's Burma, Myanmar, or whether it's uh, what happened in Christchurch a few days ago. I believe these catastrophes are happening because Muslims have not learned from their history. Simple. If we had learned from our history, we would be on top of things. People wouldn't hate us. People hate us because they misunderstand us. 
For that reason, we need to learn from our history without turning into turning this lecture into a uh, a lecture on the importance of history and learning from it. I think that's enough. For those who of you, uh, those of you who are wise, who have uh, some intelligence, and I'm sure all of you do, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, learning from our history. Mongol invasions, why are they important? Because they are important because they were one of the biggest catastrophes in the history of humanity. The Mongol Empire to date was the largest empire mankind has ever known. The Umayyad Empire was the largest until the Mongol thing happened. The Umayyads, the Muslims, were governing from northern China to southern France. This was a promise made in the Quran. We as Muslims have a belief that God promised the believers the leadership or the rulership of earth. This is exactly what Surah 24 verse 55 states. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات لا يستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم. It is a promise of Allah to those who believe among you that He will grant you succession in the land, so long as you believe and do righteous deeds, and do not commit shirk, do not attribute or ascribe partners to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Allah will give you rulership in the land, which is exactly what happened. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم dies in 632 CE, having overpowered the Arabian Peninsula, having brought the Arabian Peninsula under his rulership. He left his companions, his followers, who took the rest of the known world, in some cases by force, no doubt. Muslims conquered lands by force. They never forced a population into Islam. This is a very important distinction which Muslims must make. Islam was never forced upon people by force. The territory of Islam was definitely conquered by force. Have no doubts about that. And do not be ashamed about that. The territory of Islam was definitely taken by force. Why? Because Muslims wanted to do good. Muslims wanted to bring about justice. There were cases where Jews and Christians were inviting the Muslims into their lands to come and liberate them from the oppressive powers that were governing them, such as the Persians, the Byzantines. In Spain, for example, when Tariq bin Ziyad landed there, there are Jewish historians who testify to the fact that the Jews opened the gates of their cities to invite the Muslims in as liberators. We cannot be ashamed of our history. Our history is great. <coughs> it is amazing. It's magnif it's, it is magnificent. We have to be proud of our history because there is nothing to be ashamed of. Liberating people from oppression and tyranny is great. It's a virtue and this is exactly what Muslims are out to do. Why? Because the Quran in chapter 21 verse 107 told the Muslims that the messenger of God, Muhammad وسلم, has not been sent except as a mercy for the world. This was the mercy manifested by his followers throughout the world, throughout the globe. So Muslims ended up governing land from northern China and as far as southern France. And this was known as the Muslim civilization, where universities flourished, where Jews and Christians lived together, where people studied free of charge in institutions. In Andalus, in Spain, there was a golden age for the Jews, there was a golden age for the Muslims, there was a golden age for peaceful Christians. Muslims, Jews and Christians coexisted. Same thing was happening in the Middle East, same thing happened in the Ottoman lands later on, and then the Mughals came to power, that history is very unique in itself. We can talk about that another time. So the point I'm making is Muslim empire, if you want to call it that, or Muslim dominance of these lands brought about a civilization which lasted over a thousand years. And within this civilization, scholars, poets, scientists, philosophers, 
were produced by this civilization. So make no mistake, when people jump from ISIS to Prophet Muhammad, they have an agenda. They ignore 14 centuries of history of Islam. For a reason, there is a deliberate... When people equate ISIS with the Prophet of Islam, they say, well, you know what they do? Muhammad equals ISIS. They, they make a jump like that. Muhammad, have you seen a rainbow? Have you ever seen a rainbow? It's curvy, right? So what they do is, they ignore anything that's between point A and point Z. There is nothing between Muhammad and ISIS as far as these bigots, Islamophobes, Islam haters, politicians, journalists, people who caused the Christchurch Christ attack. They are not concerned about what happened in the middle. It is your job now as Muslims to learn about what happened in between point A and point Z to explain to people that no, 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 what you tell us is a lie. The reality is that a lot happened in between. There were universities, there were philosophers, there were poets. There were intellectuals. There were science experiments. There was mercy, there was justice, there was coexistence. There were Jewish scholars produced in the thousands under the Muslim rule. And the Jewish scholars call that the golden age. And this is not propaganda, by the way. What I'm telling you is not propaganda. It is history, which academics affirm. This is exactly what took place throughout the Muslim history. So have no shame about your history and about your faith. What the Prophet ﷺ did was great. And his fruit is not ISIS. His fruit was the Islamic civilization. The Muslim civilization from China to Spain. And this was the largest empire the world had ever known. This chunk. The promise made by the Quran was fulfilled to the letter. The companions of the Prophet Muhammad and their followers eventually ended up governing land from China to southern France. And this produced a golden age for people who were living in these lands. There is a book I strongly recommend to understand what I'm talking about. Write the name of the book. The book is Preaching of Islam by Professor Thomas Arnold. The book is quite old. Academics don't like to use old books. But this book has some facts you can learn from. The arguments are not necessarily very highly academic, but the facts still stand. Preaching of Islam makes this very point that Islam did a great job in bringing people together in creating a civilization that directly inspired the European civilization or Western civilization. What we, what we call the Western civilization, civilization today, it is, in, it is directly in, in debt towards Islam and Muslims. This is another lecture. Mongol invasions, please, coming back to Mongol invasions. So Mongol Empire was the largest empire after the Umayyad rule. The Mongols took land very rapidly and they created the largest empire the world has ever known. The Mongol record has not been broken yet. Even the British Empire was not larger than the Mongol Empire. The Mongols simply spread. Within a century, they had created the largest empire world had ever known. So this was the territory Mongols took. Look how far they went. This is something you have to understand very quickly. They started from this region, Mongolia. They spread into China. They went into Tibet. They went into Persia. They took Baghdad. They were in Mo Mo Moscow. They went into Europe. They were in Poland and Hungary. Ukraine. They went very far. They took the world by a shock. The whole world was shaken by the Mongols. And the Muslims suffered the most. According to some untrustworthy estimates, because medieval estimates are always untrustworthy. Unfortunately, they can never be 100%. That's why there, are, there is such a vast variety of views on numbers when it comes to the Middle Ages what happened during the Middle Ages, the number of armies, the number of men killed, 
the number of people who fell and the number of houses that were burnt, we can never be sure about the numbers. But there are some estimates that close to 10 million Muslims were killed in all of this region. All of this region, close to 10 million Muslims were killed by Genghis Khan and his progeny. This is a depiction of Genghis Khan and he governed from 1206 to 1227. He was born in the region today known as Mongolia and his history in itself is quite vast. We can do a lecture on him alone which I won't do today. I will continue talking about the invasions and what caused them. Genghis Khan came to, came to power in Mongolia. He united some of the Mongolian tribes. They were also known as Tatars or Tatar in the Arab, Arabic language okay, or Mughals in the Persian language. Later on the Mughals of India were called Mughals in a derogatory way. You know that word Mughal meant the Mongols. But the, the Mughals used to call themselves Taimurids because they descended from Taimur who was a conqueror in the 14th century in the same Central Asian region which is another history in itself. I will be throwing a lot of things in the middle in this lecture and if you want to research those things you will have to go away and research, research them. I cannot possibly talk about all these things in this short uh, presentation. So I will try my best to fit in as much information as possible, information that is relevant. So Genghis Khan, he united his tribes in Mongolia. These tribes were nomadic tribes. They lived on horse meat and horse milk. And uh, even to this day, Central Asia, one of the best delicacies like it or not, is horse meat. <coughs> Do you watch Mark Weems? Yes. You watch his vlogs. He was in Uzbekistan recently. By the way, do you know horse meat is halal? Yes. yes. I've never had it. I wouldn't have it. <laughs> but it is halal. It is halal. In Uzbekistan, which is a Muslim country, by population or demographically it's a Muslim country, people love horse meat there. Mark Weems had plenty of it in those vlogs. So these, used, these people were nomadic people. They had a very simple lifestyle. They, they had a very tough lifestyle. And that tough lifestyle helped them what they achieved later on. They were battle hardened. Their terrain was tough. Their lives were tough. They were very immune to cold and warm weather. And the battle tactics or war tactics are very simple. We will talk about them later, inshallah. If I don't, please do remind me during the Q&A as to what made them so successful against the adversaries. Why were they so successful against the enemies? How did they come to power so quickly? Why were people made of wool? Were Muslim armies made of wool who were fighting them? No. They were strong armies. But why did, not, why did they not stand against the Mongol flood successfully? This is a question we will address later on. So he united his tribes and he had ambitions. But he could not imagine the achievements or military achievements he would achieve later on. He was a very cruel person. References are given to him to this day. When people talk about cruelty and tyranny and barbarity and killing of innocent people, people refer to Genghis Khan. For example, Iqbal, the Urdu poet, Muhammad Iqbal, very famous Urdu, Persian and Arabic poet, a genius who died in the early 20th century in 1938. He said in one of his verses, Judaho deen se to reh jati hai changezi. Judaho deen siyasat se to reh jati hai changezi. Who is going to translate that? Go and impress me with your Urdu. Say it again. I'm sorry, I don't know any poetry in Pali language, so... <laughs> yes, go ahead. If the religion is separated from the politics, then Changhezi is left as in 
Thank you very much. Iqbal said something genius. In one sentence, he summarized the fruit of modern secularism. He said, if you separate faith, in other words, ethics, from politics, then what is left is the legacy of Genghis Khan. Because if you don't have ethics in your politics, if your politics is not ethical, this is a lesson you learn from history. Iqbal is teaching you a lesson through history. If you separate politics and religion, in other words, what you do with people socially, politically, militarily, this is all politics, right? What you do with people socially, politically, militarily, if you do not do it ethically, then what you have is the legacy of Genghis Khan. And nowadays, Hitler has been added to the list. Right? But Hitler was not as cruel as this man. He killed millions of people without remorse, as we will talk about it very quickly. Next one, please. So this is the Mongol Empire when he came to power. He united the tribes, he brought them together, and he said, let's make an empire. And the Mongols united under him because he was a strong leader, no doubt he was an able leader, he was a genius in terms of military tactics and uh, gov uh, governing. So he brought all these tribes together. As you can see, this is the Mongol Empire. He brought different Khanids. You know, Khanid is like um, um, a, a rulership. You know, Khan, the word Khan, which the Pashtuns nowadays use in Pakistan, Afghanistan and other regions as a surname or as a title, Khan actually means the Amir, the leader, the king, okay? So Khan is a short for Khakan. Khan is an abbreviation of Khakan or Khagan, which is a Mongol word that means a leader. So these are different Khanids which were united by Genghis Khan under his rule. He attacked them one after another and he caused them to submit to his power. So he united them. And after this unity, what happens next is an attack on the Khwarzimite Empire. Khwarzim Shah, who was this person, I don't have a picture of him to show you. I have a coin, a gold dinar of Khwarzim Shah. Uh, Muhammad bin Khwarzim Shah, the second who governed from the year 1200 to 1220, he governed a large empire. Go forward, please. This is the Khwarzimite Empire when Sultan Muhammad bin Khwarzim Shah is governing. His name was Alauddin Muhammad bin Khwarzim Shah. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring his coins with me. I had his coins. I have. I'm a coin collector, I'm a numismatist as well, and um, I had the actual original coins from these dynasties, even the Mongol coins, I had some of them. Unfortunately, I forgot. But, I have the images. <coughs> so, this was the empire of Khwarzim Shah. It spread to parts of Pakistan, currently Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran and close to Iraq and Syria. Large territory governed by one man. And Ibn Lathir, Rahmatullah, a 13th century historian, you're not getting bored, are you? Are you sure? I have ways to entertain you. <laughs> history should not bore you. If history is making you sleep, then you need a slap to wake up. <laughs> I meant that metaphorically, okay? Not literally. Because history is so interesting, it's so fascinating. The problem is the way it's taught, especially to your children. When you look at GCSE books on history and A-levels, I'm not surprised that kids don't want to study history anymore. Why would you want to study the appeasement theory, right? Or what happened in the Second World War, or what Hitler was doing. It's, it's important to know that. But to force children to study that boring stuff, you know, about the Second World War and other things like that, there is more interesting history. So teach them Roman Empire.
Tease them about the Greeks. Tease them about other empires so people can take interest, children can find. And when you teach people history, teach them history with substance, with material evidence so people can touch and appreciate. So there's a reason why history is not taught the, taught the way it's taught, unfortunately. Anyway, coming back to that issue. So this was a large empire governed by Alauddin Muhammad bin Khwarizm Shah. And Genghis Khan, who was here in this region and beyond, wanted a piece of his empire. So he was looking for an excuse. He was looking for his Pearl Harbor. Yes? You know what that is, yeah? Yeah, he was looking for his Pearl Harbor. Or he was looking for other excuses to attack the empire. You know this, these tactics to attack targets in modern day and age, to find excuses to attack other territories is not, uh, is not a new thing. Don't think CIA and KGB and these organizations have invented these tactics. These tactics were used in the ancient period and during the Middle Ages. So, what happened, to cut a long story short, some Mongol, Mongol merchants were in the Khwarzimite territory doing business. Cut the long story short, they were killed for something they did. It is not clear why they were killed. And Genghis Khan sent emissaries to Khwarzim Shah asking for the culprits. Khwarzim Shah said, we will apply the Islamic justice. We will investigate and those who are guilty will be punished. Genghis Khan did not accept that solution and he attacked the Khwarzimite Empire. And when he attacked the Khwarzimite Empire, I'll cut the long story short, one by one, the attack took place in the year 1219. Remember the date. 1219 is the time when Genghis Khan decided to attack the Muslim territory governed by uh, Sultan Alauddin Muhammad bin Khwarzim Shah. And at that time, Genghis Khan was already in his late 60s. He was already in his late 60s. And one after another, all of these cities were taken. First, Bukhara was attacked and the entire city was decimated. The details are far too grim and lengthy for me to go over. Ibn al to cut the long story short, paid a tribute to the martyrs, to the shahada of Bukhara, and he said, my tongue trembles and my hand shakes in telling the story of what occurred. I wish I was not born to tell this story, but I must nevertheless tell the story so that people can take benefit. And he called it the, the obituary of Islam. That, you know, what, what, how would you translate the word obituary in, in Urdu or Arabic? Janaza? Sorry? No, condolence. Condolence. Sorry? Yeah. Basically, he called it the Janaza of Islam. What he meant was the Muslims had suffered dearly. Bukhara was taken. First, there was resistance. And then, eventually, people surrendered. People were tricked into surrendering. The Mongols said, surrender and you will be safe. And there was uh, ikhtalaf between the Muslims. Some Muslims saying, no, we, should, we must fight. We cannot trust these people. Others said, no, they are ethnically the same people. The Mongols are Turkic. So are we. We are Muslims. They are not Muslims, but we are the same people. Ethnically, they will not, you know, because even despite Mongols not being Muslims, there were certain uh, standards the Turkic tribes lived by. So the people of Bukhara were under the impression that we will be treated differently by the Mongols. But they were wrong. As soon as the Mongols took over, they kept the population on the one side, and there was a group of Muslims in Bukhara who resisted and they. Uh, were besieged in the citadel. Eventually the citadel, the citadel fell and Ibn, Ibn al tells us the story that women were raped in front of their relatives.